Okie doke. Let's do some example problems with Newton's second law using torque. Uh, here's one which is uh, refers to the pendulum type device that we built in class today. Uh, so we have a stick of mass m, and we're going to say length L for right now, from one end to the other, is L, uh, even though this is a meter stick. And an axis, which is not at one end or at the center, and we'll stay with what we had today, and that was that the axis is located at 0.2L from one end. And we're asked to calculate the angular acceleration of the stick when it is released, meaning uh, I let go of it, and it's in this position, but it begins to move. It has an angular acceleration about that axis. Uh, okay, how do we do this? Well, we can do this very much how we've done dynamics problems in the past. The difference is two things. One is when we do a free body diagram, we're going to have to pay attention to where the forces act, the point of application of each force. And the, as, whereas in the past, we just drew them somewhere. And the other is that we're going to be paying attention to uh, not just forces, but the torques created by those forces. So let's start with this by doing a free body diagram. I'm going to do it right on the diagram that we have. Uh, obviously, I would encourage you to pause this whenever you can and try to work ahead, and then go back and uh, play it and see how it's done, if I can actually manage to do it right. Okay, I'm going to start by doing the forces uh, on this stick. One is the gravitational force, which we draw acting at the center of mass, and I'm going to call that mg. And then uh, we look at what other forces act, and the only other force results from the fact that the pin, or whatever is holding this thing up, is exerting an upward force uh, on the, and I call this the axle force, and, uh, uh, and that's exerting an upward force on the stick. Okay. Uh, so now we can uh, write equations, and we're going to be using Newton's second law for rotation, which is net torque equals I times alpha. But we have a little bit of groundwork we have to do before we do this. Uh, the first thing is we have to figure out what of these forces create torques about this axis. And so I'm going to make a list of two forces, I, the, or the torques created by these forces. One would be the torque created by the axial force, and the other would be the torque created by the gravitational force. Uh, the torque created by the force exerted by the ax, axle, that, that pin, uh, is equal to zero for reasons that we looked at in the last video, and that is because it acts at no distance at all from the axis of rotation. R is equal to zero. And I'm going to leave it at that. That leaves us with the gravitational force. The, uh, the distance from the axis to the point of application of the force is R. And so I'm going to write the general equation for torque, R, F, sine, phi, and then apply it to this particular situation. And in this case, the R is equal to 0.3L. The force is M times G. And phi, again, is the angle between these two uh, vectors drawn tail to tail. I'll do a quick sketch uh, off to the side of R and MG and there's a 90 degree angle between them. And so I'm going to say sine of 90 degrees, and that gets arrow 1. Please be careful. A lot of the time we're going to have these forces at right angles, but they obviously are, won't always. And so I would ask you to go through that exercise each time to make sure they're at a 90 degree angle. Uh, the direction of this torque is clockwise. And so I'm going to define the clockwise direction is my positive direction, uh, which we've been kind of using the convention that counterclockwise is positive, but if you define the clockwise direction as being positive for this problem, you can do so. I've done it. I've done so. It's done. Uh, so, therefore, if I now go back to Newton's second law here and say, what do I have? Well, I've got net torque is equal to the sum of all the torques. There are only one. There is only one. So, in this case, the net torque is equal to the torque due to the gravitational force, uh, that's the net torque. The other side equals of Newton's second law, I times alpha, uh, we've got to do a little bit of work with that. Um, alpha is what we're looking for, but what about I? What about the rotational inertia? Uh, this is the rotational inertia of a stick through the axis 0.3L from 
the center mass, I would use the center, the uh, parallel axis theorem, ICM plus MH squared. And we did this in class today, but I'll, I'll run through it quickly. Uh, center mass is stick through the center of mass is 1 12th ML squared. And this is plus the mass of 6 time, times H. Reminded that H is the distance from the center of mass to the axis of rotation. Uh, so this distance can also be called H for the purposes of the parallel axis theorem. That is, again, 0.3, which I'm going to write as 3 tenths L squared. Uh, this ends up being 1 12th plus 9 one hundredths. And that ends up being this beautiful fraction of 13 seventy fifths M. L squared. If you want to express that as a decimal, uh, that I guess is permissible, but it's not exact, don't you know? All right, so that is I about this axis. And so now I can go back to Newton's second law and fill in, fill in stuff. The first thing I'm going to do is take, is go back to blue because blue looks cool. And I'll see for this for alpha because that's what I want, net torque over I. And now I can plug in things. Uh, for net torque and for I. The net torque is equal to the gravitational torque, which I have over here is 0 0.3 uh, LMG. And that's divided by the rotational inertia, which is 13.75 ML squared. And, okay, this is now going to get kind of messy um, in terms of those, those numbers. I've got some stuff that goes bye-bye, uh, M goes bye-bye, which is, I paused for a moment, that's interesting because it tells me that the uh, angular acceleration of the stick is independent of its mass, uh, which your intuition might have told us. Uh, and I have one of the L's go bye-bye, and I end up with uh, 0.3 times... 75 over 13, which is clearly 22.5 over 13, times G over L. Uh, and I can actually put in numbers if this is, in fact, a meter stick. Uh, by the way, this is also something, this is interesting because it does tell me that the angle acceleration is dependent on G, which means that it would have a lesser angle acceleration if I were on the moon set this up on the moon, that might make sense. And it's also dependent on L, which may or may not be intuitive. It's, and L is on the bottom. That tells me that if I actually had a much longer stick, if this stick is pivoted at 0 0.2, 20% from one end, and the stick is 30 feet long, it's going to have a lesser angular acceleration. It's going to accelerate more gradually. It's going to start to swing more gradually. And that is kind of interesting. Um, and so, so I think some of you in class today were kind of discovering that uh, with, with the experiment that we had. Uh, the length of the stick actually influences how rapidly it begins to angularly accelerate. Uh, okay, I'm going to put in numbers here just because I'd like to. And so I'm going to uh, pause this and grab a calculator and see what we get, assuming that that is a one meter long meter stick. Okay, putting in 9.8 meter per second squared for G and 1 meter for L, I end up getting an answer of about 17 radians per second squared. Uh, it is what it is, uh, and I guess it makes me happy. Okay, I'm going to set up another problem. Okay, boom, I have a second example set up here. Uh, and let me explain what we have. It's, a, it's kind of like an Atlas machine, but with a mass only hanging from one side. What I have is a pulley and a mass the string is presumably wrapped around the pulley, and, uh, and the string won't slip off the pulley, so we've attached it on the pulley somehow, but it's wrapped around a couple times, so the mass can roll, can, can fall, and un the string unwinds off the pulley, and this pulley will rotate. This, of course, is an axis, 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 it's an X, marks the spot, and, uh, and I've also noted that the pulley, I'm modeling as a uniform cylinder, and just to make life fun, I've made the pulley have the same mass as the block hanging from the string. And the question is, uh, what is the acceleration of the block? It's a friction, frictionless pulley, but it's not a massless pulley. It's a massful pulley. And that's going to affect the rate at which this block accelerates. Okay, how do we approach this problem? 
Well, we have two things to draw free body diagrams of. One is the, the block, and the other one is the, uh, the pulley. So let's do them one at a time. Uh, I will do the pulley first. I'll label it as the pulley, which is a cylinder, and what forces act on it. There are, the reason we're doing this is to find out what torques are created on the pulley. Only one of the forces creates a torque, but I'm going to label all the forces anyway because I like being thorough. There are three forces acting on the pulley. One is its own weight, the gravitational force, mg, earth pulling down on it. The other is this force exerted by the pin, whatever is holding this thing off the floor. So we have one of these things I call FAX, the force exerted by the axle on the pulley. And then the other thing is the string pulling down. We have a tension force, which I will call T. And uh, I might be interested in the linear acceleration of this pulley, except I'm really not because it doesn't have any. The pulley isn't accelerating up or down because the axis holds it in place. So basically this axle force is going to adjust itself based on the, the pin that's holding this thing up to cancel out mg and t added together to keep this thing from falling down on the floor. And so linearly this thing is not interesting, but rotationally it is. And so I will say, oh, net torque equals I times alpha, because I'm very interested in the fact that this thing is going to be rotating faster and faster. OK. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second. Let's do the same analysis for the block. And the block, uh, I'll draw right here, is the block. And here I'm interested in, uh, in forces on the block. There are two. Mg and the tension force. And in this case, the block isn't rotating in any interesting way, but it's, it does have a linear acceleration that I find interesting. And it, the so I will be interested in analyzing the net force on this block, it, which is going to be equal to its mass times its acceleration. OK. Uh, so let's get into each of these in a bit more detail. First of all, I'm going to define my positive directions very conveniently as the direction in which these objects are accelerating. And so I'm going to say that the mass is accelerating down. And so I'm going to make this the positive direction. I don't have to worry about distinguishing an x or a y axis from each other because this, the mass is a one dimensional problem. It has a positive direction and a negative direction, and the positive direction is down. Uh, the pulley, on the other hand, I'm interested in. Uh, in the direction that it's rotating, and and so again, this is a, essentially a two-dimensional. Oh, I'm sorry, one-dimensional problem, clockwise and counterclockwise. I'm going to make clockwise my positive direction for the pulley, and uh, because that will be the direction of its angular acceleration. Okay, so now I can start writing equations. Uh, let's start with the pulley. Uh, net torque equals I alpha. I need to come up with what net torque is and what I is. Uh, net torque, in this case, is the sum of all the torques. And there are three forces acting on this pulley, but only one of them creates a torque because the, uh, the force exerted by the axle and mg both act no distance at all from the axis of rotation. And so they don't create a torque. Uh, but the torque created by the tension force exists. It is R times F times sine of phi. Um, and what are these values? OK, the tension force is exerted at the edge of the pulley. So I'm going to draw this as the, this, the uh, vector that goes from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the tension. That happens to be also equal to the radius big R of the pulley. Um, but the little r in here stands for the, remember, for the distance from the axis of rotation to the point of application of the force. But for, the, for these purposes, this turns out to be big R times the force, tension, times sine of phi. And guess what? This time I will do this by extending this line of action of, of r. Uh, and the, the angle that that makes with t is phi. And that is equal to 90 degrees. And so I will write sine of 90 degrees in arrow 1, that bad boy. So the net torque is equal to R times T. OK, what about I? I is 
the rotational inertia or moment of inertia of this uniform cylinder. And I can look up, uh, it's rotating about its center of mass. I don't have to do any parallaxis theorem for that. Remember, the, we're, we're analyzing just the pulley, so we're interested in the center mass of just the pulley, and that is in the middle of the pulley. So I can just look up the rotational inertia of a uniform cylinder about its center, and I find out that that is one half m r squared. Uh, looking it up in that chart in the book. So this net torque equals I alpha turns into RT for the net torque equals one half m r squared times alpha. Uh, we can tidy this up a little bit because one of the r's goes bye bye and we end up with T equals one half m r alpha. Okay, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> and what you might be saying, why did we do that? Because we're interested in the linear acceleration of the block. Well, it's because we're going to have to use some of that information we just got from the pulley to figure out the linear acceleration of the block. So let's analyze the block. I have net F equals MA. Net F is also equal to the positive MG minus the tension is equal to M. And I'll write big M for A because that's what I'm calling this mass is big M times A, uh, and I say, okay, good, I've got mg minus t is equal to m times A, uh, and I don't know what the tension force is. Presumably, I can leave this in terms of big M, but I don't know what the tension force is, and so I can't, I don't, I, I can't answer the question yet. What's the acceleration of the block? I could, I, I can look over here and say, oh, look, I've got an expression for tension. I could sub that in. And so I can say that uh, MA is MG minus, and I'm going to sub in for tension, one half MR alpha. But I've just taken out T that I don't know, but I've introduced alpha that I also don't know. And I say, woe is me, until I realize something. And that is, this goes back to the uh, two wheels connected by a non-slipping belt thing that we looked at a day or two ago. And that is that... If we go back and look at our original diagram, this block is accelerating down with linear acceleration A. Well, the, the, it's dragging this rope behind it, and the rope is attached. It's a non-slipping rope, which means that the, uh, if the rope is accelerating down at 2 meter per second squared, the edge of this, uh, of this wheel, this pulley, has a linear acceleration of 2 meter per second squared. Well, I can relate that. That's A at the edge is equal to A of the block. And I know that A at the edge, if I can fit this in here, is equal to alpha times big R radius of that wheel. That's one of the relationships between rotational and linear kinematic properties. And so I can go down here and say that the A at the edge is the same as the A at the block. It's equal to alpha times R. Uh, that means that alpha, alpha is equal to A over R. This is A edge, which is equal to A block over big R. And A block is what I'm looking for. This is starting to look like it's going to make me happy because now I can say M A equals M G minus one half M R alpha, but alpha is A over big R. That A of the block is the same as this A of the block over here, which is what I'm looking for. Okay, stuff is about to make me really happy. First of all, the M's go by by, then the R's go by by, and I'm left with. A equals G minus A over 2. And now I just kind of tidy things up. I bring the A over 2 over here. So I get 3 halves A equals G. Or A equals 2 thirds G. Look at how happy I am. Thank you very much. Very much.